welcome. This will be the first in a series of discussions about the early days of cataract and refractive surgery. We're celebrating an anniversary. 75 years ago, Harold Ridley implanted the first IOL in what was a dangerous and controversial procedure that has now evolved into a very safe and effective elegant surgery, one of the most common surgeries performed in the world. Uh, we're joined by Drs. Richard Packard, Thomas Moyham, and Hans Reinhard Koch. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Richard, I want to start with you. Um, this, we are starting by talking about Ridley. This was a dangerous surgery. It was performed without FACO, without VISCO, without even a microscope. Tell us about that. Sean, thank you very much. Yes, it certainly was. Now, Ridley was interesting in this regard because the actual idea of implanting a lens was something that he thought about 10 or 15 years earlier. He discussed it with his father and his mentor, who both sort of said to him, you're a crazy man. But I think some of the experiences that he'd had looking at the injuries to young men where bits of perspex had got stuck in their eyes had stuck in his memory. Many others had seen it, but it didn't have the same effect on them. And when somebody made the suggestion to him that maybe he should put a new lens back in the eye, that was the trigger he required for the cure for ace fakia. And as we know, and we will discuss many times during the course of the 75th anniversary year, this was what led us to intraocular lenses. But it's not what we're going to talk about today. We're talking about things that happened somewhat after that. We've got these two eminent gentlemen here. I'm going to talk to them both about their experiences early in their cataract surgery careers and how things have developed since then. So Thomas, if I can start with you, could you give us a little bit of background about where you trained, what, when you did your first cataract surgery, how you came to FACO, and who were the most important influences in, in, in your learning of FACO and getting to feel comfortable with that procedure? Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a complex question. Uh, to start with the easy answers, I trained at the University Augen Clinic, uh, the University Eye Clinic in Heidelberg, uh, then under the directorship of Wolfgang Jäger, who was uh, at the time uh, the secretary of the German Ophthalmological Society and the big gray eminence in the uh, ophthalmological, German Ophthalmological Vatican, and, uh, uh, and who was also uh, in charge uh, for over all of Germany of the alliance of again, the ophthalmological Vatican for the never again lenses. So he would collect uh, from all over Germany, the then in the early 70s remaining cases of implanted lenses, uh, mostly of course, from the German anterior chamber lenses. And so that was the, uh, with respect to lens implantation, that was the uh, atmosphere under which I trained. My first cataract surgery must have been, I started in 1973, so it must have been 1975 or so. Earlier, they would never let us into the OR. Uh, and at that time, Heidelberg, through uh, the younger um, layer of professors, had just uh, recently adopted microsurgery, corneal step incision, with running tubing and nylon sutures. That was what we, what we had to learn. A corneal incision, a step incision, uh, keeping the cornea open, a short prayer, cryo extraction, and then close, 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 so no vitreous would come. So that was it. And then sitting there with, with shaking fingers and trying to get and as regular tubing in running nylon suture in as possible. That was my, uh, my first encounter with cataract and surgery. Baptism of fire. That was my baptism of fire. And the other, uh, the other baptism of fire was my father and Professor Walze in Munich, who were absolutely sensational masters of the Grafe incision, the right eye with the left hand, the left eye with the right hand, uh, unbelievably uh, good surgeons. And at the time, they would even use sutures, imagine, to close the incision and not just let the cornea 
snap back, a double uh, binocular bandage, and seven days of bed rest. And what about FACO? Oh, FACO. Uh, when I left Heidelberg after uh, getting my uh, specialization in 1977, I went to Mainz University Clinic under Professor Nova. And uh, his next in charge was Professor Steinbach, who ordered a FACO machine, the Cavitron 8000, at the time, the first one that was ever available at all, and then became chief of a eye department in Düsseldorf. And two weeks after he had left, the machine arrived. So we, three young people, uh, who were surrounding the machine and looking at it and asking ourselves what the hell that was. Then some of us tried it and every pupil when even seeing the FACO tip, shrunk to about one millimeter of diameter. And then uh, they went to Eric Arnott to London to see how it worked, because nobody in Germany, of course, and Dardenne's clinic, who already made FACO, was, of course, out, out of question. For, for. Then in, nine, in, uh, yeah, in 1979 or 80, I don't quite recall, I think in 80, I got an invitation for the different Congress of anti World Antisepsis in New York, and they paid for my air ticket to New York. So I took, I grabbed that uh, opportunity, then from New York, traveled to Los Angeles with a $99 standby ticket to see Richard Kratz. And that changed my entire professional career. Uh, I saw an unbelievably elegant phaco emulsification, as if it was nothing, uh, by manual with a little iris hook. His pupil shrunk too. It didn't, it didn't matter for him. He took a little iris hook, pulled the iris open, slipped a shearing lens, not one of those big course lenses, into the eye. Uh, and my first thought after those two days was, okay, I go back into cardiology. This is not this is not anything that I will ever learn. I just don't have the hand for that. And um, then I went back with the first reactive depression of my life and, uh, and sat at night in our OR with the FACO machine and cadaver eyes that I brought from FACO and desperately tried if I couldn't make it. And at one moment, it worked. The, the lens was out and the shearing lens slipped in. And I sat there and said, shit, shit, now it worked and, and, and I don't know what I made different. <laughs> but from then on it worked. Wonderful. And Shana, would you like to tell us of your similar experiences? Well, I was trained in Bonn on the Rhine, beautiful city. Once you're there, you don't go away. <laughs> so I did see all continents and I've traveled uh, more or less uh, everywhere and did surgery in lots of places, but I always had to come back to Bonn, my hometown. Uh, the University of Bonn at the time was uh, quite renowned. Uh, the first 20 years of mine uh, in ophthalmology, no, the first 10 years in ophthalmology were spent on theoretical research in the Institute of Experimental Ophthalmology, mostly involved in lens research. And my habilitation to become lecturer and then professor was on a subject, biochemistry of the lens, more or less. One of my reviewers was a professor of surgery in Bonn, Gut uh, Gutgemann, and on an after habilitation party, he called me and said, Mr. Koch, your work was very interesting, but don't forget, money is earned in the OR. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my theoretical uh, 10 years ended and I uh, did more clinical, clinical uh, work. Uh, and there my clinical teacher was basically Ulrich Darden, 
in my theoretical 10 years, I had done half-time clinical work under Erich Weigelin, and I had done cataract surgery, intracap, cryo extraction, large incision. I was quite good at it. <laughs> and uh, I was still able to do it on some uh, subluxated lenses uh, later when everybody else said, how, how can we handle this? So, uh, FACO started with Ulrich Darden, uh, I think in 78, uh, more or less. I did my first uh, FACO cases, and FACO meant no IOL. In those days, you were either an implant surgeon or a FACO surgeon. FACO surgeons wanted a small incision, no astigmatism, mm -hmm. And that meant cataract glasses, although with low cylinders. And implant surgeons wanted to put in lenses. They needed a big incision. And uh, that was incompatible with FACO. So there were two camps of modern surgery, one the FACO surgeons and one the implant surgeons, Jacobi in Germany. and. Both were uh, scandalized by this, the normal ophthalmology establishment of the professors at the universities, but uh, it was difficult to get the two things together. Could you elaborate a bit more on the struggles that Ulrich had with the DOG and German ophthalmology when he started doing Faker? Because that's a story in itself. Ulrich had... Uh, fooled around with irrigation aspiration techniques for uh, infantile and uh, pediatric cataracts. So for him, irrigation aspiration was something that he had worked a lot on before mm. and had Goida built many machines for him. So when uh, <coughs> Charlie Kelman came along with FACO. Ah, I should tell you how I met Charlie Kelman. First time we almost met was when I was 14 and was sent to Switzerland uh, to Geneva to a family close to the Ecole de Chemie in Geneva. And we didn't know that just around the corner lived an American medical student, Richard, uh, Charlie Kelman. <laughs> Extraordinary. We were a couple of houses away from each other, as we later found out, but we never met at the time. We met in 1970 at the International Congress in Mexico. Uh, I had the honor to present with my boss, Erich Weigelin, techniques of uh, quality control for tonometers very important matter, but uh, not very sexy. <laughs> and we had an exhibition stand, and next to our stand was just a table and a video uh, projector. And my neighbor was uh, Charlie Kelman. And the stand was mostly empty most of the time, and then once in a while, Charlie would come down with a couple of people and say, at this video. And there I saw my first FACO video. Well, I, I played that video this morning when my, in my talk on FACO dynamics right at the beginning, so I know what you're talking about. But so what happened to Ulrich? I mean, it, it, it was horrible, wasn't it? Uh, Ulrich um, went to New York to see Charlie perform cataract surgery with FACO. He was convinced, came back, and wanted to do it in Germany. And then he was told, no, this is too dangerous, too complicated, so we don't want that in Germany. And then Ulrich decided he would talk to the health insurance companies. And that was a no-go for the professors of ophthalmology. Yeah. Ulrich told the companies, well, if you uh, support FACO, you earn a lot of money, not two weeks or three weeks of uh, hospitalization, 
uh, not changing cataract glasses so many times, and so on. And the health companies, health insurance companies said, okay, we'll make a contract with you and you can put FACO. And the professors in Germany were horrified. So they decided uh, he should be uh, expelled from the German Ophthalmological Society. And that was the meeting in uh, 1978 in Dusseldorf. Uh, chairman was uh, Küchler, and uh, there was a long member meeting. They talked about two hours about uh, the need to expel Darden, uh, and they were still waiting for some paper from a lawyer uh, <laughs> before they could proceed. And then when this paper arrived, they said, well, Mr. Darden, you can uh, also talk, uh, but make it short, <laughs> time is too advanced, just five minutes. And uh, everybody was, most people were furious about the way the meeting was handled. My boss, Erich Weigelin, said that's an unverschämtheit, that's an insolence. And uh, so there was a vote. In the end, it was a majority for expulsion of Darden, but not the qualified uh, majority that would be needed of two thirds, mm -hmm. with just 50 something. And uh, so Darden could not be expelled, but on the day after, he sent in his resignations and said, I will no longer be member of the society. Good for him. Yes. Okay. So, Thomas, when you started <coughs> doing FACO all those years ago, how did you do your capsulotomy at that time? The way I learned it from Dick Kratz, and that was a so-called can opener with a cystotome. Human. Cystotome was a, uh, what might it have been, a uh, 23 or 21 gauge tube with a little hook at the end. And uh, it was called can opener because the mechanism was the same as uh, we in our youth camps would open cans with made little nicks one after the other. Uh, one of the unforgettable uh, um, ways of saying it of Ulrich Darden was don't make tiger teeth, which a lot of people made huge, big flaps, but <laughs> make tiny little mouse teeth. That, so, uh, so with Darden in one ear and what I had seen with Dick Kratz uh, in my other part of the memory, we did a very, uh, as well as we could perform it, mouse teeth, can opener, capsulectomy. And then uh, we did uh, immediately proceed the way Dick Kratz had modified Charlie Kalman's Bego emulsification because, I mean, there's no doubt, Charlie invented it, but I always say, but Dick made it work. Uh, Charlie prolapsed the nucleus into the anterior chamber, and that uh, it, it, that was not, uh, let's put it friendly, that was not very endothelium friendly. At the time, uh, however, a lot of people were very um, reluctant to acknowledge that the endothelium was such a sensitive uh, cell layer, I remember sitting next to Bill Simcoe in a congress in Florence where somebody uh, showed the first uh, viscoelastics uh, and that, that it was good for the endothelium. And then Bill Simcoe turned over to me and silently whispered into my ear, Tom, do you believe in the endothelium? <laughs> so, uh, so that was done. Uh, Dick Kratz made it work in, in that he left it in the posterior chamber hollowed out the, the nucleus with the phaco, then pulled the phaco tip back a little bit, still in the chamber, stopped irrigation for a moment, put the spatula into the step downwards, uh, inclined the nucleus forward just a little bit, put, put the irrigation back on, and then worked up the nucleus. So that was the technique we used. At IA, of course, the way we still do it today. And Hans, what about you? Was this similar to, to your experience? I imagine it was. Um, we started like that. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, we originally learned uh, from Charlie Kalman, mm -hmm. but we got our real in the real technique that we uh, perform most of the time from Richard Kratz. Uh, he was our teacher. Yeah. That mirrors my experience. May, may, exactly. May, may, and may I just come up with Yeah, yeah sure. And uh, we tried to implant lenses. Um, only that then did three uh, iris supported lenses early on. Mm. Very bad results. And we said stay away from uh, intraocular lenses mm. until we had the lens of Richard. That's the Christ lens. That showed us this could work. And then we started implanting lenses. Uh, we left the small incision of three millimeters. We enlarged. We had to make a suture, but still, that, is. that was at the time the best way of handling it. Absolutely. May I just tell a, a funny little story about oh, Kalman and Kratz's techniques? Kalman and Kratz were at one of those secret uh, conjuration meetings of the FACO guys in America. And Charlie Kalman, in his inimitable way, said, well, folks, if you don't do it the way I do it with the anterior chamber, then you cannot call it a true KPE, Kalman FACO emulsification. Then Kratz, who was almost a British gentleman, Californian, said, well, Charlie, then, uh, then uh, why not keep it a KPE and call it a Kratz fake emulsification? Very good. Uh, yeah. uh, just a funny story. Mm. You just mentioned the Florence meeting. Uh, Charlie Kalman hated traveling. Because oh, yes. he had put so many uh, stones in his way. So uh, in the Florence meeting, Charlie had just got a new watch, wristwatch, with an alarm. <laughs> so we saw Troutman in the street in Florence. He put the alarm on and held the wristwatch to his ear and started the film with it. And uh, Troutman was flabbergasted. And then <laughs> Charlie said, uh, to his secretary, assumedly, uh, I got it at this and that street in Lawrence, and Troutman <laughs> immediately walked there to get the same sort of telephone watch that Charlie had. <laughs> and now it's no longer a joke because everybody has a smartwatch and can run with the watch. But Charlie knew this in 78. Yeah, I'm, it's such a Charlie story. Late 70s, early 80s, yeah. <laughs> Thomas, so what, what decided you to change the way that you would do your capsulotomy? Um, when we started putting lenses in, I, uh, just a short recapitulation, when I came 1977 from Heidelberg, the never again uh, uh, capital, to Mainz, they had just started putting the first Pinkos four loop lenses in just 100 kilometers north of Heidelberg. Uh, and um, that this Professor Steinbach uh, was always on the very progressive side. And when we saw FACO, uh, uh, we saw a, a film by, what was his name in, in, um, um, in Georgia, in Atlanta, Georgia, with A. Uh, he had put the first shearing lenses in in that film. And we sat there, still see ourselves in the lecture hall, with a mouth open, and say, that's the way to go when that lens disappeared behind the iris. It was, of course, implanted in the sulcus. We then got shearing lenses were absolutely not available in Germany. Heyer Schulte was the only company that made them. Heyer Schulte, Germany, told me, no, 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 that's bullshit, we don't have that. I said, yes, in America you do. So we got our first 10 shearing lenses. I, because I lived in Munich and Heyer Schulte was in Munich, I collected them there. Of course, standard 19 diopter lenses, no biometry of it, for God's sake. Uh, and so we were very early, I think we were even the first in, in Mainz, in Germany, to put in posterior chamber lenses. 
And uh, I had seen that with Dick Kratz also. And obviously the way to do it was uh, the way my guru did it, in, it put them in, in, into the sulcus. At the same time, almost at the same time, David McIntyre in Seattle. Was it Seattle? He was, yes. Yeah? Uh, David McIntyre had started putting these lenses into the capsular bag. And the capsular bag versus sulcus controversy started right there. He suffered from the complications that we now all know, uh, that these lenses, lenses decentered very easily, which was not easy to admit for those who were for the bag. And, uh, and Dick Kratz always said, yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't see that yet. One day in 1980, in early 1984, uh, Dick Kratz told me at a meeting, Tom, I think it is time now to go into the bag. Since he was my guru, I said, if Dick Kratz says it, uh, let's do it. I put them into the bag and at least 50% turned out to decenter with one loop out. I called my brother to testify that I had really put them into the bag. Say, can you, did, did you see the loops of the bag and so forth? 50% were out so up to a week in later. Out uh, yeah, in out, in out position, exactly. And that. then that was the first time where I ground my teeth and I said, even when my boss, my guru says it, as long as I don't find a, uh, a way to keep that damn thing in there, I'll stay in the sulcus. One day in November, and, and, and then uh, uh, Rüdiger Welt from Frankfurt had visited uh, Jim Little. And Jim Little at the time had a capsulotomy because he wanted to put it in the bag too, where he did a can opener in the upper circumference and then grabbed in with tying forceps, no viscoelastics, mind you, under an air bubble and tore it from three to nine. Well, that was what was called the envelope technique. Uh, no, that was called the D-shaped capsulotomy. Okay. D, but it was Binkhorst, the the, the the at the same time, with his two-loop lens, did, did something like it and tore it out uh, in more or less of an arc as, as well as he could get it. Uh, so, so that this tearing technique was there. And of course, we all knew how the capsule behaves because when it ruptured, sure. we knew that just a little nick and it just falls apart by itself. And as long as the capsule is, is intact, you cannot tear it. It behaves like cellophane. So, I thought you must, we must have a continuous margin. That was purpose, that was not, that was not uh, uh, by chance. But I had no way of uh, finding out how to do it. One day in November of 84, I have a young girl with a pigmentary retinopathy and these people very often have very loose zonules. So I start my can opener on that gal and the lens moves but the capsule doesn't open. And I sit there and say, hey, if I insist, I mean, I'm gonna rip, rip this lens out intracapsularly. And I then decided in my desperation to use the blade, the 15 degree blade, to go through my uh, scleral tunnel and cut it open. And then remembering the D-shaped capsulotomy and then offered one of my precious vials of Helon. I was the first in Germany to have Helon uh, but I had three or four, and, and I mean, they were saved for, for the big catastrophes. And I, I used that, went in with, the, opened the incision, went in with the tying forceps, and tried to tear it. And miracle, miracle, it, it, it tore open, and the lens didn't move, of course, because, as we all know, tearing is so easy. And, and I came back on the other side, and I said, oh, I got the capsule out. And only then, sitting in front of it, I said, well, shit, that's what you always wanted. That was my first capsular exit. <laughs> okay. 
And when did you realize that this was fundamentally going to change the way the FACO was going to be performed? Oh, that very moment. Really? Yeah, yeah because, because to put the lens in the back, well, that it would change FACO the way it did, with, uh, it necessitated them, right? That I didn't realize at once, of course. Uh, but that it changed, that that was the prerequisite for putting the lens into the bag and keeping it there. That I had recognized before, I just didn't know how to do it. And how did you get other colleagues to, uh, to adopt this? Now, the reason I ask this question is because the first time I saw FACO mastification, and Hans Reinhardt was, was there as well, and this was in Bordeaux in 1986, when Jürgen Gleiter uh, did live surgery. He was at the, at the end of, of the session, and it was one of those moments where the audience is completely stunned. We all sat there with our jaws dropping because we realized that this was something special. So he learned from you, is that correct? And yeah. He, he was of chief of the ophthalmological department of the hospital in Harlaching, yeah. which is one of the suburbs of Munich. And, uh, and he saw one or two of my cases with the lens in the bag at the round, smooth edge capsulotomy. Mm -hmm. And he called me, we were good friends up. Uh, we were good friends like same city, knew each other and so forth. And uh, long story. Uh, and, and he said, Hey, shit, what are you doing there? You're doing something different. And then I said, that was in early 85. And, and then I said, Jürgen, please, I, I, I'm going to document it first. <laughs> please understand that. Uh, uh. And, and then I said, but come over. Uh, I trusted him, he would not steal it away from me. Come over. And then he came over and looked at it. And and said, and we immediately realized, asked why I would do it. We talked about it, and he realized that that was the way to go. And when did you realize that Gimbel was doing the same thing? My brother, who had seen what I was doing, went to, uh, to Boston for the first time, joined me in the practice, and for the first time, the ASCRS, when he was in Boston, I said, Toby, we can't go both. Uh, this year you go there and, and I stay home and do the practice. And Toby comes back and says, Thomas, I saw a film. There, there is a Canadian who's doing something, something that's similar to what you're doing. And uh, I had seen the film and in 1985, it was like, you must do a film also to, to document what you do. And I, we had a friend who was working for Ari, the, the big, uh, camera company that makes all the cameras for Hollywood at the time. Uh, and he was kind enough to take one of these super costly, I mean, we, of course we didn't have a camera on the microscope at the time. Uh, he lent me one of his precious cameras, uh, made the, uh, the optical conjunction. We hung up the microscope on the ceiling because the thing was so heavy, the microscope wouldn't support it. And, uh, and I made my first film in April of 85, uh, showed it in Munich, and then showed it at Ascris 1986. I was there, I don't remember that, yes. Yeah, it, it was, it was, in, Los, it was wanted, in Los Angeles, wasn't it? I wanted to introduce it into the competition, and when I arrived and brought my film, they said, oh, sorry, the acceptance has been closed already. They're already sitting down there. We, we, we can give it to them, but you can't take part in the, in the competition anymore. And then the film was shown. And then, uh, and then Spencer Thornton, who was on the committee, said, there's another must-see film that they included into the winner's showing, and that, that was mine. <laughs> and when Gimbel saw that film, he sent me a message. You remember in America, at the Ascris, you could have messages uh, uh, tabled out and uh, could I call him and I, Toby didn't know that it was Gimbal and so forth and that uh, founded a lifelong friendship that lasted. Together, yeah. yeah. Hans, when did you do your first uh, CCC? Uh, Udi Peschke, who was one from the industry. Indeed, yes. Uh, got a copy of your first uh, film of Rexis. He sponsored the film. And he came to me uh, immediately afterwards and said, Hans Reinhardt, I have to show you a new film. And he showed me this film, uh, fresh 
from the from the camera and it was on the day on the evening before leaving for india for my first big uh, international FACO course in Bombay, first FACO course in India. Mm. For me, one man show, one week, every day surgery in the morning and uh, lectures in the afternoon, very stressy. On the last day, uh, I couldn't think of anything special anymore that I could show on life surgery and I remembered uh, this interesting video that Rudy had shown me and I said, by the way, there's a new technique of opening the capsule. And I took a needle tip and made my first rexis and it was firm, ripe, perfect. So it's been downhill ever since. Has yeah, everybody was flabbergasted. And I returned to Bonn, I told my nurses, now there's a new way to open the capsule. And I tried to do it again, <laughs> and it took me, I say, two months until I really could <laughs> consistently do a rex. <laughs> and, and Hans, what was the first foldable lens that you put in? Ah, that was also in the meeting of the that it was. mentioned. Yeah, was that with Christine Kreiner? <laughs> uh, that was the lens of the just mentioned Rudi Peschke and Christine Kreiner, their company at the time, Adato Met. And uh, the inventor and producer of that lens was a friend of mine in the Saar region, Gunther Fromberg. Uh, he had uh, really the first silicone lens. The silicone had one problem. Uh, it was not sufficiently flexible and sometimes maybe one out of 10 implantations, the lens broke. broke. And uh, at Bordeaux, I was the only one who dared to fold the lens. Oh. Then this one lens broke. Interesting, Kreiner was furious, but it was not my fault. It was the fault of the silicone of the lens. Uh, oh, that's and right. Then she, then she told everybody, yeah. uh, Hans Reinhardt has drunk too much Bordeaux wine <laughs> last night. That's why he broke the lens. <laughs> the, 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 the problem was that early silicon only had the refractive index of 1.41, yeah. unlike the modern silicons, which are 1.46, which is why it was so fat and difficult to uh, to, to fold. The lens that you designed, you had a lens called silicon, I remember. Did you put that into the into the into the bag or did you put it into the sulcus? The the first were put into the sulcus. Um I think once I started with Anagan lenses, that was the time when uh the in the bag implantation was mm -hmm. the normal procedure. And Thomas, what was the first foldable lens that you put in? Was that also? Uh, that was the star lens. Okay. Uh, I remember we had visiting uh, in 1985, I think that was, 85 or 86, but I think it was in 1985. We had the uh, successors of Dick Kratz in Van Nuys, uh, Rayasic, uh, a, a guy by the name of Rayasic, and Pete Utrada. They were touring Germany with lectures and um, uh, um, sponsored by Star to show their first lens. And then we were, we were there, of course, and uh, uh, my brother and myself, and we discussed that they put it in the sulcus, of course, uh, um, or no, they tried to put it into the bag and then had uh, 10,000 ways of trying to keep it there or putting it back into the bag when it, uh, when it was in and out and so forth. And then in, 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 the, in the pause between the lectures, uh, I went up to the two guys and says, well, um, um, we, we have a technique there. Uh, we had just, just got the film back. So it must have been in 85. Uh, we have a, a technique that we can show you where you will not have those problems anymore where we can keep the lens in the bag. So Reyesic and Utrada came to my brother's place because he was the technical guy at the projection. It was all 16 millimeter films. And we projected it and they were 
well, that's the solution, <laughs> which, I mean, so obvious. And uh, I, I, I showed it with the needle because I didn't have helon, so I had to find a way, not doing it with my tying forceps. Uh, and uh, uh, um, Howard Gimble then, as I found out later, did it with the sister tome still, but he had to make several nicks and so unite. We're basically, we're doing it with irrigational punch. Yeah, yeah, then, then, no. And then he combined them. And I thought I didn't want to combine it. I wanted one incision, tear it around as I had done with my forceps, and then include the, <laughs> the stabbing point into the, uh, as we do today still. And um, uh, the, the, um, the, the, this needle rexes, Pete Utrata then later told me that he, he thought that was too difficult for him. And, and, and then he, he, with the first helons that the Americans had and not we, uh, um, invented his famous Utrata forceps and did it that way. Yeah. Hans, in, in. I have to tell in a story. Oh, go on then. At the time when we were all involved with foldable lenses, there were some surgeons, and not the worst surgeons at all, who were not convinced about foldable materials. Our friend Crosafon, for example, took a long time until he was convinced. Actually, there was this band, this gang of four. Yourself, myself, Philip, and Bill Maloney. Indeed. We did the tour. How many FACO courses did we do together? Anyway, Philip was not convinced about foldable materials. And at a meeting, yeah. I can't remember where, somewhere in the States, there was a meeting uh, about how to handle stigmatism with smaller incisions. Uh, I talked about foldable lenses. After me, Bill Maloney talked about foldable lenses and said, actually, he had implanted his partner, surgical partner, with an elegant foldable lens, and he was so happy. And then Philippe came on the rostrum and said he was preferring a smaller optic lens Five millimeter was sufficient, and uh, that was much better, and you couldn't have to have this complicated foldable material. And he himself, he said, had, had Thomas Neuhan implant his five millimeter lens into his own eye. Indeed, he did. His, his conclusion was, so do remember, take silicone for your partner, but you PMMA for yourself. <laughs> Yeah, I put plenty of those Crisophon lenses in made by Pharmacia as well. <laughs> now, we, time moves on, as it always does in science and surgery and medicine and so on. What do either of you think about some of the newer developments for automated capsulotomy that we have today? Thomas, what would you say about this? Well, in my heritage lecture for the ESCRS uh, a few years ago, when Beatrice Cochonaire was president, uh, I concluded my lecture, and I, I still think about it today. Uh, I think about it the same way today. Is it about capsule rexes will one day be history? Uh, for, for the time being, not. But it will one day be history. But, but then I twinkled with my eyes, and, but it will have contributed a bit. And uh, um, then about a year later, the, uh, uh, what's this, uh, yeah, the, the, the one that sparks uh, capsule, capsulase. Not the capsulase, the other one? Uh, Zepto. Uh, Zepto. Uh, the Zepto came out and was uh, viewed with a lot of attention. Uh, then the Femto came out and the capsulase that needed dye came out with Pavel Sudurka. And uh, I was looking there and saying, yeah, they, they all do a great job. But of course, uh, for a couple of thousand, 10,000 or 100,000 euros as, as a price. Uh, but that, that'll be much cheaper in the future. 
I think we have seen the way it will go. I have used the Zepto just to try it out. It hasn't convinced me terribly by its advantages over, over my 10 cent needle that I can bend myself. Uh, the Femto, just for a capsulotomy, as the Americans would put it in their papers, is not quite cost effective uh, for 400,000 man years or so. Uh, uh, and, and the capsule laser uh, appears to be a lot cheaper, but again, you need a wide pupil and so forth. So for the time being, uh, I think all these solutions, if you use a femto laser anyway, well, well of course, you, you switch on the, the capsulotomy function uh, at the same time. But for the time being, I do not see an advantage for either the Zepto nor the capsule laser over needle or forceps or whatever, whatever one prefers, uh, perform manual capsular exism. Not because it's my thing, but because uh, it, it, there, there is no visible advantage in the end. And since uh, ten tens of thousands of, of ophthalmologists have in the meantime learned how to do capsular uh, rexis, but again, you know, I, I'm open. And the only thing I, I remain with is nothing, at least so far, has ever been eternal. So capsular rexis probably is all it like. Hans, do you have any views on this, or is this uh, after your time? Um, rexis done by a dexterous surgeon and, and the right size cannot be really improved by anything else. But if you're not a very dexterous surgeon and your rexus will not be centered, will not be concentric, um, then a laser might do the thing with high precision and with less deviation from what you really want to achieve. Some, some techniques become forgotten, like intracapsular surgery, um, how wonderfully would we do that? And nobody can do it now. And I think uh, when lasers become cheaper, more available, laser is sexy, <laughs> a needle is not, we, then the technique will be replaced not because it's really better or does something that the other mm. technique cannot do, but because it's the cause of time. Okay, fair enough. Now, this is an ESCRS meeting. When was the first time that you attended an, either an EIIC or an ESCRS meeting, Thomas? Do you remember? Uh, way before it was ESCRS, uh, uh, EIIC meetings, the first ones, I... <laughs> It's unbelievable when you look back and you realize how old you have become. <laughs> uh, uh, Carl Jacobi, uh, when I was still on the black sheep uh, way, and Carl Jacobi, not a FACO, but an implant uh, advocate, uh, held his hand a little bit over, over this black sheep. And uh, I, I was uh, elected against the will of the big professors into the council of the DGII, and then Jacoby at an EIIC meeting um, said, uh, "I will retract from the EIIC. You uh, you represent Germany in the future." He says, "Did did 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 that have to be elected or, uh, or something?" No, no, it's enough if I if I say that. That's uh, that's how should I say <laughs> the good side of German professorship. <laughs> I've and uh, so I was, uh, <laughs> I was delegated as a German representative into the EIIC, and ever since, I've, I don't remember having missed a meeting. Hans, what about you? I try to remember <laughs> when was my first meeting. Well, I know we were together in 85 at the meeting in Cannes. Did you go to any of them before yeah, that? Probably that was not the first. Mm -hmm. Cannes, that was special. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving forward, what, from your long careers, as we're going forward in ophthalmology, what would you like to see as the next big change 
in cataract and refractive surgery? What do you think would really change things? Hans, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the ideal would be the individual lens uh, custom made for the individual patient. And so uh, there are developments into that direction already now, but I think it is still a bit far away. Thomas. Well, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's, it's so very obvious in terms of, um, you know, one, one can dream a bit. <laughs> uh, I, I, with my Arabic patients, when they say, doctor, how is this I going to develop in future? I'll say to the interpreter, I say, tell him Allah has only one prophet and his name is not Mohan. <laughs> so, so with that <laughs> as the, how should I say, as the, as the top theme, uh, one can dream a little bit. Of course, uh, the individualized lens, we have started with a tiny little bit of individualizing the lenses with individual aberration correcting lenses, and we've presented our results already. The physicists are furious because they say, well, that uh, uh, then you see very sharp, of course, but you have absolutely no depth of focus anymore. That's bullshit. We have proven that it is not that way, and we've given it an, an, uh, an explanation why the eye is not an optical bench, but it is an optical bench with a chip with image uh, uh, computerization behind it. That's what the eye is. So uh, customization, the next way of customization would of course be what, uh, uh, what Hans Reiner just said, with a truly accommodating lens. And we currently don't have a better idea than uh, nature had for accommodating lenses. Uh, and um, since we know that the ciliary body works at age just as it worked in young years, or at least for all practical purposes, uh, using that mechanism and replacing the lens as a soft material, an accommodating lens, then for removing the cataract, uh, a way of dissolving the lens without any mechanical uh, aspects or so, it could be a dream. And in the end, the ultimate dream would obviously be to prevent the protein changes that Hans Reinhardt has so carefully researched. <laughs> in the first 10 <laughs> but, years of my career. Exactly, that you have to, to, uh, to, that we use, that we can use your research to reverse it or to, uh, or to, um, or to make that it doesn't happen. Uh, uh, so that we don't, in, in the end, don't need cataract surgery anymore. And the problem is then we ophthalmologists have an earning problem. Well, luckily we'll all be after, retired by then. <laughs> after my theoretical 10 years, I got an offer from Alcon to come to Fort Worth and develop a drug for conservative, drug treatment of the lens. And I was shown around at the campus. I was shown my possible office and my labs. Uh, and so um, I was really <laughs> most interested. But in the end, I'm very, very happy that I should accept the offer. <laughs> yeah. okay. I'd just like to close with one final question. Both in the case of Kelman and Ridley, you had a brilliant surgeon with a great idea, also worked with a, a member of industry who had the insight and the interest to develop that idea. So I wonder if you had any thoughts on this, uh, then and now, the role between industry and, and the inspired surgeon. Yeah. May I mean? Okay, without the industry, the development as we have looked back on it now, would never have been possible. Uh, it was not only the problem of uh, learning new techniques, it was the problem of disseminating 
these new techniques for the ophthalmological community. I've already mentioned the Gang of Four. We did FICO courses right, left, and center in many countries, always the same group. Uh, I was, for some years, practically once a month in some town or city in France, because I was one of the few ophthalmologists who was speaking French. And all this was sponsored, paid for by the industry. It would never have been possible to do this on your private own purse. Uh, today, there's a tendency to say, oh, that's very bad. The industry sponsors uh, Richard Packard so he can teach uh, his colleagues uh, to use uh, the company's uh, things. That was not the case. It was a truly uh, impartial uh, communication of a number of surgeons who were willing to train Thank you. and a number of surgeons who were willing to learn sponsored by the industry without that it would have never have had this fast advanced course that we have seen at the about today yeah i couldn't agree more uh the the industry has made has made things happen and has made uh, uh, game-changing ideas by physicians be accepted by physicians. Charlie Kellman, 1977, no, no, a little, uh, after 1977 in his Binkhorst lecture, very amusedly cited the then uh, top cardinal of the American ophthalmological Vatican, Derek Vale. Ah, oh, yes. That was his book, Pink Horse Lecture in 89. Huh? Yeah. See it? 89. Yeah. 89. Cataract surgery has been developed to its ultimate state, and any development henceforth shall be insignificant. You know when he said that? 1962. And uh, a little later, when he invited Harold Ridley to present his, his lenses uh, at the American Society of Ophthalmology, he stood up and called Harry Ridley publicly ruthless for his efforts to implant a lens. So if we were dependent on our colleagues and our masters, if we had been dependent, let's put it that way, because things have changed, uh, thanks God, and thanks to the colleagues. But if we had relied on our masters, uh, we would still we would still fight about the gravy knife, or is that too modern? No, well, it's industry that that brought us forward, and this partnership. Industry alone can can't do it either. This partnership between physicians and industry uh, that has made things happen, and I don't see a reason why we shouldn't keep that going, uh, and this oh, childish afraidness and fear of everyone being, uh, uh, being viable and, and so forth is a bit ridiculous. We are already big boys. We, 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 we can uh, take care of ourselves and we can behave properly. Wonderful. Gentlemen, thank yes. you very much. I think we did for joining us. If any of you would like to learn more about the heritage of cataract surgery, then you need to visit ESCRS.org. Thank you.